Skyward Sword had some interesting bosses. Since Skyward Sword uses motion controls, and especially the Motion Plus, the combat was pretty exciting, and some of these boss battles were incredibly fun and well made. However, there are a few that totally sucked as well, so let's see which bosses sucked, and which didn't. We're also Triforce, I'm on the one, and this is our Skyward Sword boss ranking. We're just gonna get it out of the way. The Imprisoned was one of the worst things in this game, and we put all three encounters with it here at the bottom. We both agreed that it would be a fine boss encounter if you face it once. However, when you face it three times, with the objective being the same, it gets really boring. You have to prevent it from reaching the temple by either knocking it down, or jump onto its head and hit that stake into its head again in order to steal it. For every encounter, there are some differences. It's got arms in the second encounter, and it can fly in the third. And you get help from Gruus and his, well, actually very impressive work called the Grusinator. These battles are very annoying, as you get stunned by its footsteps, how it can just slide up the hills, and how much space it takes when it's knocked down, so you might have to find another way to reach his head. Not to mention that the design of the imprisoned's appearance is lame as hell. It has no face, just a giant mouth, it has long arms, and the stupidest looking nails on its hands and feet. The imprisoned battles were slow, boring and annoying. It could have been fine with just one of the encounters, but when you face it three times, psh, to hell with this. We're not really that sure if we're supposed to call this a boss battle or not, but it is a part of the battle against Girihim, and you do fight a lot. Number 10 is the Horde battle. You don't face a single boss in this battle, but a horde of bokoblins, moblins, stalfos, and whatnot. Towards the end of the game, Girihim sends wave after wave of enemies towards you, and you have to fight all the way to reach the villain himself. And it is a bit intense to just slash your way through. We've never encountered such a big amount of enemies at once in a Zelda game before, and it's definitely more fun than the imprisoned. Plus, this battle should get you ready for Hyrule Warriors. You all probably saw this boss before the game came out, but back then, we saw this boss in a whole other setting. We saw a giant scorpion in a forest, but it turned out that Moldorak would be the boss in a desert dungeon, that being the Nairi mining facility. It is actually very cool looking, but what kind of makes this boss look bad are the obvious weak spots. It attacks with its claws, but it can also do a swipe with its tail. As soon as you deal enough damage to its claws, they'll disappear, and it will burrow itself in the sand and you will have to use the gust spells to dig it up again. It's a fun use of the dungeon's item, and we appreciate there being two different faces, even though the second face isn't that hard. The only weak spot left is its eye, and it's pretty easy to hit now that it's very open for attacks. It'll dig itself down into the sand multiple times, but just searching for it can be fun as well. It's an okay boss, but you face it again later as a sort of meter boss, and nothing has really changed and we think that decreases its uniqueness. This game is filled with different deities, and one of them is the great spirit of the skies, Levias. While Levias and Bilokite are presented as two different bosses, we decided to put these together as one. They both feel more like two faces of one battle, since Bilokite is really the one you're fighting, not Levias himself. You hear that something wrong was going on with the Levias before this encounter, and since Pum, the owner of the Lumpy Pumpkin, usually serves the Levias' pumpkin soup, you help him out deliver a batch in order to get close to him. Scrapper lends you a hand to carry a huge batch of soup into the Thunderhead. Suddenly, this giant, whale-looking creature shows itself, and it's got some weird eyes popping out of holes on its body. This battle has a good build-up, and a very good atmosphere, and it's even the only boss battle that takes place in the sky, while you're riding your Loftwing. The objective is simple, as you have to destroy those eyes by using the spiral charge. It sounds simple, but controlling can be a pain, since I never was a huge fan of how you control the Loftwing in the first place. It's often hard, well to me anyway, to actually hit the targets. After the eyes have been destroyed, a big face with one eye pops up at the back. And this is where the battle against Bilocat begins. This is where you drop the Loftwing and stand on your feet on the vice's back, and have a good game of Deadman's Volley. This time though, you don't just hit the ball straight back to where it came from, 
but you must swing the Wiimote to get it in the right direction to hit the eye and the flappy things. It's ears or... I don't know. Balakite will also move its head, so you have to pay attention to where target is. This battle is unique with the aerial combat and of course the more precision-based battle of Deadman's Volley. It's atmospheric and it's all in order to help Levi's get rid of his corruption. Still, there are far better bosses on this list. Girohim is one of the best villains in the series. He's entertaining, he's funny, he's overdramatic, and he's just really, really weird. You fight him three times in this game, and we picked his second encounter as number seven. This battle is a bit tougher than the first, with him wielding two swords, having hardened arms, and is more serious about fighting Link. However, the jump from the first encounter to this one wasn't really big. It was more difficult, but it was pretty much the same battle with slight differences, like an additional sword and such. Oh, and there's one tiny little thing. Throughout this game, we were teased and made to believe that there was a vicious serpent dragon that we might have ended up fighting some time in the game. The Earth Temple had lots of dragon sculptures, even dragon bones, there were symbols everywhere, and Nintendo even teased us by showing us a fiery dragon swimming in lava in one of its trailers. Since this game came before Ocarina of Time in the timeline, and it's mentioned that Volvagia was resurrected in that game without us knowing that it was dead in the first place, or that it had existed at all, only True and I were led to believe that we were gonna see Volvagia in this game. That hope was crushed as soon as Girohim showed his face at the end of the Fire Sanctuary. We know that we were the ones getting our hopes up, but really, it would make sense to have Volvagia exist here, and the things shown in the trailers really made it seem likely. It might be an unfair minus point towards Girohim here, but that's definitely not the only thing keeping this encounter so low. This is by no means a bad fight at all. It's actually a very good one, and it is better than the first. However, we don't like this one as much as the first encounter, and I'll get to why when we reach its place on this list. While we're at it, Skaldera was a bit of a disappointment, since that's actually where I really thought Volvaga would appear. Anyway, the battle against Skaldera was actually a unique one. It turns out that that boulder you ran away from, Indiana Jones style, actually was the boss itself. It's introduced in a cool way, but its appearance is just... Nah. It doesn't look very intimidating, and those legs look silly as hell. However, that core of it looks incredibly hot and intense. The reason why this battle is unique is because of how you actually have to run in a straight line both up and downhill to fight against it. It'll spew giant fireballs, it'll chase you, and it will roll down the hill. Though the way to actually damage it, it's pretty much like a Dodongo fight. First you have to send it down with bombs either by throwing one, or let it run to the top where the bomb flowers are. When it stops, it'll inhale air to spew fireballs, and that's when you throw a bomb in its mouth before attacking its eye. Again, it's unique in the way it's introduced, how you fight it on a linear path, but the appearance and the Dodongo-like attack tactic puts it on 6th place. The reason why we put the first encounter with Girahim above the second on this list is because of the whole wow factor he brought as the first boss in the game. We had already had our fun using the motion controls against enemies already, but fight against Girohim was where you really got to test the combat style Skyward Sword had to offer. I had a lot of trouble with this boss the first time I played this game. Not because of the controls, but because I wasn't sure what I had to do. I actually died several times, and that's embarrassing, because it's not that hard once you know how to damage him. There is no clear weak point to this guy, and it was kinda hard to see if you actually were dealing damage. He can easily block your attacks with his hand, and he can even steal your sword and use it for himself. Later, he uses his own sword and becomes more aggressive with different moves. He teleports all around, he sneaks up on you, and he's the first freaking boss in the game! There's great variety in this battle, and the fact that you actually face a villain who is following you throughout the whole game is the first boss you encounter is just awesome! In fact, this is the first time you even meet him. This battle is great as the first boss, it's just too bad the next encounter didn't improve much, especially when they consider that this was the boss in the first dungeon, and the second encounter was in the last standard dungeon in the game.
It's kind of sad that Screw Attack ranked this one as the number 10 worst boss in the series, but I kinda understand where Nick comes from. I mean, I just talked about my disappointment with giving him and the Fire Sanctuary, but it still doesn't make him a really bad boss. Tentalus doesn't have the greatest battle, and definitely not the greatest appearance, but the strongest side of the encounter against him is the atmosphere. Sure, it's weird what a coincidence it is that the ship is attacked by a monster the second you reach the control room, but it's awesome how these huge tentacles start attacking the ship, destroying walls, floors, and let water get into the ship. The fact that you have to cut off these tentacles before you even see how the monster looks like makes it really intense. When you reach the deck, you see that the ship has been totally wrecked and this giant abyssal leviathan, to use the game's words, appears before you on this stormy sea. The weak spot is obvious, and with the dungeon's item being the bow, it's pretty easy to know what to do. But the battle keeps being interesting, with the tentacles penetrating the deck you're standing on, and that you have to cut several of them before it shows himself and is open for attack. There is a second phase here, where the deck gets wrecked, and you have to climb onto the very top of the last part of the wrecked ship. This time, all the tentacles will attack you straight on, as they seem to have mouths, kinda like snakes. This phase is pretty easy, because you don't have to do much else than to swing your sword rapidly until the eye, once again, is open for attacks. Maybe the boss isn't that great when it comes to the actual battle, gameplay-wise, but the fact that this giant sea monster wrecks the very dungeon you just went through makes this boss battle a very memorable one. The last time you face gear him is the best battle against him. Unlike the encounter with him in the Fire Sanctuary, this battle changes almost completely from the previous. Girahim is about to resurrect his master by using Zelda's, or rather the incarnation of Hylia's body. His patience flows over, and his whole appearance changes. His skin is suddenly made of hard metal or something, obviously to become more armored. It is also at this point where we see what he really is, Fai's counterpart. He's also a spirit of a sword. In this battle, you first face him on top of platforms that he made himself. He carries no weapon, and he shows no signs of pain when he hit him. All that happens is that you knock him backwards. He's aggressive with physical attacks, but they are easily avoidable as he clearly shows when he's gonna attack. Knocking him back makes him fall off the edge and down to another platform, where he's on his back and open for a stab in the chest. The only differences between these small faces is that the platforms get bigger and it restricts the open air around him for attacks. When this part is done, he draws a sword like he has done earlier in the game, and you now fight him at the ground. The weak spot is now very clear, and only a thrust attack will hurt him. This part actually does play a lot like the other battles with him, but it's definitely not easier, which is great considering that this is at the very end of the game. But before he goes down, he has another weapon up his sleeve, an even bigger sword. In order to reach his chest, you have to slice through his sword and break it. At first, I found this battle very difficult. I stressed and attacked quickly. I thought to myself that since this is the final battle, and Gear him definitely wasn't kidding around anymore, that I had to move quickly. However, during my second playthrough, I noticed I had plenty of time to just see where I needed to attack. I thought the battle was fast paced and intense, but it's actually really slow as long as you stay calm. I might actually dislike that a tiny bit, and I'm afraid that we're not really into the music that plays during the battles against him either. The battle changes up a lot more from the previous two, and just the appearance alone and how we learned what kind of creature he really is, is something we appreciate. Giraim was an amazing villain, and we think this battle was worthy of being his last appearance in the game. Girahim's master and the ultimate evil we had heard about throughout the game showed himself when Girahim actually succeeded in reviving him after the last battle. It is then that we see Girahim turn into an awesome looking sword that Demise grabs in his hand. He lets Link prepare himself before they have an ultimate battle. There would be no excuses as Link could come prepared, and that they fought in a place without any room for outside interference. My experience with the battle against Demise was kinda like the one against Girahim. I attacked in a rush and ended up taking a lot of hits. When I finally realized I could be calm here too, I found the first phase to be really, really easy. However, I can't exactly say the same thing about the second phase. Okay, before I go on, I have to say that the surroundings in which you find him are awesome. Really, really awesome. 
It's so open, beautiful, symbolic, open for interpretation, kind of like the battle room where you face Dark Link in Ocarina of Time. There is shallow water, blue sky, and sunlight before the fight, but then it turns darker. The music is all fine. But it's after you knock him down the first time everything gets knocked up a notch. He jumps back up, lightning starts flashing, the rain is falling, and the music becomes really epic. Throughout the whole fight, Demise has been really good at using the sword to defend himself and block your attacks. In this phase, however, he won't only block your attacks, as you both now can hold your swords up for a skyward strike, and then receive lightning to make your blades electric. He becomes much more dangerous with this, but so do you. Many find this battle easy and lame, but we can't help but feel that this one is really epic. It got easier for me this time around, especially when I'm new to take it slow, and that I actually didn't know about the lightning strike at first, and beat him without it. We didn't know much about Demise, we just knew he was a force to be reckoned with, and we ended up with a battle that was pretty satisfying. The sword fighting, the surroundings, the atmosphere, the music, the lightning, and of course his badass appearance makes up for a very good finale to this Zelda game. Not to mention, another final battle ends with a thrust. Maybe it's getting a little bit old, but we say it's still awesome. You all know what's missing, don't you? Our number one is a very beloved boss and it's very, very easy to be why. The boss that tops our list is of course Koloktos. The boss in the Ancient Cistern is one we both instantly loved. The appearance of the whole thing is kinda weird in some ways, I mean its face isn't the coolest thing ever, but the fact that it has six arms where two of them throws boomerang blades, two others that try to pound you, and the last two actually covers up the weak spot makes it look pretty badass. The objective here is to pull off its arms by using the whip, and every time we do, it feels so satisfying. You're ripping off a giant robot's arm, and these giant pieces of armor just fall off, making a lot of noise. We feel powerful. Once the two pounding arms are off, it'll use the other two covering the weak spot to hit you, and once they are pulled off as well, it's open for attacks. It'll reattach its arms back on after a few attacks, and this continues on until the second phase. Holy crap! It comes out of the ground, standing on two legs, and now uses all six arms to carry swords. And if the music wasn't good enough already, this part of the theme definitely makes the battle more intense. I remember sitting there when I fought Coloctus the first time, saying to myself, HOLY SHIT! How it surprised me with standing on its feet and moving around the room. Attacking wildly by swinging its arms made it really intimidating. The song is the same as the one against Moldorak, but it was hardly noticeable there. It fits perfectly with this boss, and this face is just incredible. Three arms will sometimes try to hit you at the same time, and once again, you pull those arms off while they're stuck to the ground. Since the weak spot is now barred up, you can't use your own sword to attack it. This time, you pick up one of his. <laughs> this is so awesome! You can cut off its arms first, or you can go straight for the legs and the weak spot. This battle is just amazing. We feel powerful by ripping it apart, picking up its swords and cut off its legs, and just destroying it. In addition to this, you can even cut down the pillars yourself if you're in need of hearts. The intimidation this boss brings, the way you fight it, and the mix with the music makes this one of the best dungeon bosses in the series, and our favorite in Skyward Sword. Thanks for watching.